It's widely known that Germany had its own atomic bomb project during World War II. This fact has been used as a plot device in so many movies and books that it's kind of hard not to know that, uh, yeah, Nazis really did try to build a nuclear weapon. What's less well known is that Imperial Japan tried to do the same thing. In this episode of The Atomic Bomb, we're going to investigate Japan's World War II atomic bomb program, Tokyo's own Manhattan Project. Stay tuned. Japan's atomic bomb project began with this man, Lieutenant General Yasuda Takeo, head of the Japanese Army's Aviation Technology Research Institute. It was Yasuda who saw the military potential of the nuclear fission research that was being done in the West, how the tremendous instantaneous release of energy in a nuclear chain reaction could be used to create an unimaginably powerful bomb. In April 1940, a year and a half before the attack on Pearl Harbor, Yasuda assigned one of his staff officers, Lieutenant Colonel Suzuki Tatsusaburo, to investigate the feasibility of making an atomic bomb from uranium. The report Suzuki submitted in October concluded that such a uranium bomb was indeed feasible and recommended that a project should be started, as the United States was probably doing the same thing. General Yasuda circulated Colonel Suzuki's uranium bomb report among the top echelon of the Imperial Japanese Army and the Navy, starting in October 1940. The Navy wasn't interested. The Army was. In the spring of 1941, the Japanese Army gave General Yasuda funding to set up an atomic bomb project. The project was assigned to Japan's premier scientific research center, the Institute of Physical and Chemical Research in Tokyo, commonly referred to as the Riken. The Riken's leading scientist, physicist Nishina Yoshio, would head up the top secret project. It would be codenamed Project Nigo, the Ni being the first syllable of Dr. Nishina's name. This was Japan's Manhattan Project. In comparison to the actual Manhattan Project, it was minuscule, tiny. The entire budget of Project Nigo during the course of the war would scarcely total half a million American dollars, less than a thousandth of what the United States would spend to develop the bomb. As we saw in Episode 1 of this series, the Manhattan Project's quest for the bomb advanced on multiple fronts. It developed a plutonium bomb and a uranium bomb. And for the uranium bomb alone, it developed three different methods of uranium-235 enrichment, gaseous diffusion, liquid thermal diffusion, and electromagnetic separation. Project NIGO, with its extremely limited facilities and vastly smaller budget, could not afford such a lavish approach. Dr. Nishina and his team would investigate uranium only and would pursue only one avenue of uranium enrichment, gaseous thermal diffusion. It took Project NIGO an entire year just to get to this point and prepare the required plans. During this period, it was essentially a two-man operation consisting of Nishina himself and his colleague, physicist Tamaki Hidehiko. Finally, in the fall of 1942, Nishina began to build a larger team, mainly by recruiting recent university graduates who had been drafted into the army. Most had the rank of first or second lieutenant. When work kicked into high gear in mid-1943, Project Nigo had a full-time staff of about a dozen men. At its height, in 1944, it would number about 20. 
They would be based at the Riken Research Complex in northern Tokyo, near Komagome Station. Here's an aerial view of the place just prior to the war. Here's another shot from 1954. The NIGO team was allocated a nondescript building on the grounds, known simply as Building 49, located about here. It was a two-story wood structure, formerly a dining hall, five rooms on each floor, total floor area 330 square meters, or about 3,500 square feet. Here's how the project was organized. The theory team, originally just Nishina Yoshio and Tamaki Hirehiko, laid out the plans for the project, did the calculations, and figured out how much enriched uranium they would need for a bomb. According to their calculations, 10 kilograms of uranium, enriched to just 10% U-235, would do the trick. This was a severe underestimation. By way of comparison, the Hiroshima bomb contained 64 kilograms of uranium, enriched to about 80%. The chemistry team, meanwhile, was tasked with producing the actual substance that would be used in the enrichment process, uranium hexafluoride, hex for short, a crystal in solid form, a gas at temperatures above about 56 degrees centigrade. Next, the separation team would build and run the thermal diffusion separator, the device that would do the enriching increasing the concentration of U-235 atoms in the hex gas. Finally, the analysis team would test the samples that came out of the separator to determine how much they had been enriched. Here's a rough approximation of the 16-foot-high thermal diffusion separator, looking a bit like a water heater on end. It would stand on the ground floor of Building 49 and extend up into the second floor through a hole cut in the ceiling. Here's a sketch by Dr. Nishina from his project status report to the Army of how it worked inside. Uranium hexafluoride crystals were placed into the receptacle here and heated so that they turned into a gas that accumulated here. This hex gas then passed upward through a narrow gap between two long copper pipes, a smaller pipe inside a larger pipe, like this. The gap was just two millimeters wide and had to be exact for the entire length of the pipes so that the gas would circulate smoothly. The outer pipe was kept relatively cool, 50 degrees centigrade. The inner pipe was heated to 350 to 400 degrees. As the uranium hex gas circulated through the system, exposed to a heated wall on one side and a cool wall on the other, the ever so slightly lighter uranium-235 atoms would tend to accumulate at the top and the heavier U-238 atoms at the bottom. Run the separator for a time, allow the gas at the top to solidify back to crystal form, and hopefully it would have a higher concentration of U-235. Down in Kyoto, meanwhile, another atomic bomb project is now being started by the Japanese Navy. The Navy hadn't been interested in the atomic bomb idea prior to the start of the war. But now it is. By this point in the war, the Navy has lost almost its entire fleet. Almost all its ships are sunk. It's desperate for something, anything, to turn the situation around. So it starts its own atomic bomb program. This second project is dubbed Project FGO, the F being for fission. It's based at Kyoto Imperial University under Professor Arakatsu Bunsaku. Professor Arakatsu and his small team focus on the same element as Project Nigo in Tokyo, uranium, but pursue a different enrichment method. 
They will try to separate uranium-235 atoms by using a device called an ultra-centrifuge, a centrifuge that can spin at the fantastic speed of 2,500 revolutions per second. The design was completed in July 1945, but the machine itself was never built. Project EFCO, in fact, never got beyond the theoretical stage. This story, incidentally, was the inspiration for a recent Japanese movie, Child of the Sun, English title Gift of Fire, that aired on NHK in August 2020. Okay, so back to the Riken in Tokyo. It's now the middle of 1944, and Project Nigo is not going well. It's taken a full year for Kigoshi Kunihiko and the chemistry team on the second floor of Building 49 just to figure out how to convert Dr. Nishina's precious supply of uranium into uranium hexafluoride. This substance, a crystal in solid form, was so little used at this time and so unfamiliar that Kigoshi had to struggle through months of trial and error before he could produce it and contain it because it was extremely corrosive. So that was the first hurdle. The next was being encountered by Takeuchi Masa and his team downstairs on the first floor, trying to build the separator. Obtaining the necessary materials in wartime Japan to build a device was a huge challenge, and obtaining the necessary degree of precision was almost impossible. To give just one example, the two copper pipes at the heart of the separator, one pipe inside another, they had to be perfectly straight. They had to be exact so that the gap between them was exactly two millimeters for their whole length to ensure smooth confection of the hex gas. But Takeuchi was unable to obtain pipes that perfect. What the army allocated to him were bent, and he had to try to straighten them by hand. The separator was finally completed in July 1944. For the next four months, Takeuchi Masa and his team fed Kigoshi's uranium hexafluoride into it and tried to get it to work. Finally, in November 1944, they started getting something. Tiny crystals began to form in the separator's upper collection chamber. These precious samples were eagerly sent over to the analysis team for testing in Nishina's cyclotron to determine the degree of uranium-235 enrichment. The verdict? No enrichment. The Project Nigo team was devastated. Three years of effort, and they weren't even one step closer to building an atomic bomb. It was, in fact, hopeless. The separator didn't work. And even if it did, there was hardly any uranium available to run through it. General Yasuda, who had come up with the uranium bomb idea back in 1940, had assumed that uranium would be easy to obtain, probably from Korea, a colony of Japan at the time. The uranium ore available in Korea, however, turned out to be extremely low grade, and sources in other parts of the empire weren't much better. And then the empire itself was falling apart, and ships were no longer getting through to Japan. So by the end of 1944, the prospects of obtaining enough uranium to build just one bomb were looking pretty dim. Project Nigo effectively ended on April 13, 1945, when a B-29 bombing raid badly damaged the Riken. Building 49, with the separator inside, was initially saved from the flames. The smoldering embers, however, weren't completely extinguished. The building caught fire again the next day and burned down as Dr. Nishina and his exhausted colleagues looked on. If there was any consolation, it was that they now knew that it would take years, possibly decades, for any country to build such a weapon 
Even the Americans couldn't do it. Not in this war. It would take even the Americans years to build an atomic bomb. They were wrong. <laughs>